Hey everyone, it's Mostly Casual Commander, I'm BK, and this video is sponsored by Wizards of the Coast. We're excited to be playing the Outlaws of Thunder Junction Precon decks. We've upgraded them a little bit, about 20 cards swapped. If you haven't ordered your product yet, do so today by using the link in the description. J-Man won the die roll and he's playing Yuma, Proud Protector. It's a Lands Matters deck. It's focused on landfall triggers and deserts to take advantage of his ability. Matt is playing Stella Lee Wild Card. This is a deck is going to have him sling a bunch of spells because it's a spell slinger deck. Scott is playing Olivia, Opulent Outlaw. It's an outlaw tribal deck with a lot of synergy that focuses on draining his opponents. And Chris is playing Gonti, Canny Acquisitor. He's going to steal all sorts of cards from his opponents and cast them for cheap. If you didn't know, we're on Instagram and Discord. Please subscribe if you haven't already and stick around for an appearance from my fat cat, Meatball. He's so chunky. J-Man kicks things off by playing a Sheltered Thicket, and then he passes over to Matt, who plays an island as his land for turn before casting Preordain. So he'll scry two and draw a card. He decides to keep one on the top and put one on the bottom and then draws the one he just put there. He passes over to Scott who plays a Temple of Silence as his land, scrying one and keeping it on top. Afterwards, Chris's turn starts. He'll play Lana War Wastes as his land before passing back to J-Man. He draws and plays a Terramorphic Expanse as his land for turn. He'll crack that immediately and pass the turn. He'll go and find a Plains with that, and Matt plays an Island as his land before casting an Arcane Signet, getting some early game ramp on. On to Scott's turn two, he draws and plays Shadow Blood Ridge as his land, and casts Humble Defector. This thing can tap to draw two cards, then you gotta give it to somebody else. He passes over to Chris, he draws and plays an Island as his land. He then drops a Lightning Greaves. That'll make somebody a Shroudy Boy or Girl. He passes over to J-Man, who draws and plays Arid Mesa as his land. He immediately just cracks into that, losing one life, and he finds a basic mountain. He then uses that to cast Chromatic Lantern. This will give all of his lands identity issues. He passes, Matt draws and plays a Storm Carved Coast as his land for turn before casting Urabrask. This thing can generate him some mana and deal some damage whenever he casts an instant or sorcery. He passes over to Scott. His first action is to activate his Humble Defector and draw two cards. Then he gives it over to Chris so that he could do the same thing on his turn. Afterwards, he plays an Orzhov Signet, trying to pull ahead on mana production. And then he plays a Fetid Heath as his land for turn. Then using that bad boy and his Orzhov Signet, he'll cast Zulaport Cutthroat. He'll start draining his opponents out whenever one of his creatures dies. He passes the turn over to Chris, and on his turn three, he plays Twilight Mire as his land for turn. He then activates Humble Defector, drawing two additional cards. He then decides to give it back to Scott, and the two of them work out a little bit of a deal to keep passing it back and forth and denying the other two so that they could pull ahead. Chris loses a life to his Twilight Mire when he casts Shadow Mage Infiltrator. It's a 1-3 with fear, so it can't be blocked by most things. He then moves to equip his super fast boots to it before moving into combat, swinging at J-Man. That'll ping him for one point of life, and because it did, he gets to draw a card. He then says go over to J-Man. He draws, and then he plays Hazazon, Shaper of Sand. This guy is a pretty big deal when it comes to playing deserts and desert-related things. He then plays Dunes of the Dead. It's a desert. So his Azon triggers, so he gets two red, green, and white sand warrior creature tokens. He passes the turn over to Matt, who plays Thunderclap Drake, reduces the costs of his spell slinging spells, and can maybe copy a thing, then pays two life for Frexian mana of Gataxian Probe. This will trigger his Urabrask, generating him a red mana and dealing one damage to Scott. Chris and J-Man also thought they were supposed to take a damage, but we correct that in a little bit. There's no impact to the game. Matt looks at Chris's hand with his Gataxian Probe and draws a card before playing his commander, Stella Lee, wild card. He then passes the turn over to Scott. He draws and activates Humble Defector, drawing two more cards. He then passes it back to Chris per their political deal. He plays an Exotic Orchard as his land for turn, and he casts Reign of Riches. This not only makes him two treasure tokens right now, but it also enables some cascading should he use treasures to pay for stuff. So he passes the turn over to Chris, who draws and plays another island as his land. He then activates the Humble Defector, drawing two more cards, and instead of giving it back to Scott, he says, here you go, J-Man, trying to secure some favor there. He moves into combat at Matt, pinging him one and drawing, thanks to his Infiltrator. He then pays one life and his Twilight Mire to play Dark Ritual, generating three black manas. With that, he's able to cast his commander, 
Gonti Canny Acquisitor. He drew that dark writ off of his infiltrator. Otherwise, he would have cast Gonti before he went to combat. He does move his super fast boots over to his commander, giving him some shroudy protection. He then passes the turn. And on J-Man's turn five, he draws, activates that humble defector, drawing two more cards. Then he moves that over to Matt, being a team player. Following that, he plays Hashep Oasis. This will trigger Hazazon, getting him two more Sand Warriors. He represents those summoning sick ones with the dice. Then he plays Skullwinder, and because J-Man saw Chris and Scott working together, J-Man proposes that Matt and him be friends. So with Skullwinder's ability, Matt returns Gitaxian Probe to his hand, and J-Man returned an Arid Mesa. On Matt's turn, he plays a Mountain as his land, activates Humble Defector, and returns the Defector back over to J-Man. He then casts Gitaxian Probe once again, so he looks at J-Man's hand this time, and he gets to draw a card. He also pings Scott with Urabrask. He generated one red mana from Urabrask as well, and then he casts Lightning Bolt with that super fancy Japanese artwork. He once again pings Scott with his Urabrask, and then deals three damage from his Lightning Bolt to Hazazan. This also triggered Matt's commander, so he exiles the top card of his library. It's a Veyrin, so he can cast that until the end of his next turn. Then, using that one floating red mana from Urabrask and the cost reduction that he has, he casts Grape Shot. So he has it deal damage to each one of his opponents in an equal amount because he's a nice guy. He also pinged Scott one more time with his Urabrask. He then casts Niv Mizzet Perun that he just drew. So he's starting to stack up to be a real threat. On Scott's turn, he drops a Desolate Mire as his land, and then he casts Life Insurance. So this thing can start making him treasure tokens whenever another thing dies. He used a treasure token to pay for that, so Bane of Riches triggers, and he starts cascading until he found a Rankle Master of Pranks. He's a hasty boy that does stuff when he deals combat damage. Scott asks Chris, you got any flyers? Chris says, yes, my fists. And when Rankle hits him, he triggers. He'll have each player discard a card and then lose a life to draw a card. And Chris drops to 29. Because Matt drew a card, Niv Mizzet triggers, so he'll ping down Scott's Zulaport Cutthroat before it can get out of hand. And Scott completely forgot that that was a thing. But I mean, when Zulaport Cutthroat died, each opponent lost a life and Scott gained a life, so that's cool. In addition, Scott's life insurance triggers, so he'll lose a life in order to make a treasure. On Chris's turn, he plays Rogue Class. So one day, it could be kind of like his Gonti, whereby it exiles stuff and maybe he could play it. Chris then plays Thieving Varmint. Can help him cast stuff he doesn't own. He then moves into combat, swinging Gonti at Scott and his Infiltrator at Matt. There's a bunch of triggers whenever they connect. First, he'll draw a card, thanks to his Infiltrator. Then he'll exile cards from Scott and Matt under Gonti. And then he'll exile cards from Scott and Matt under his Rogue Class as well. The ones from Ganti he could play immediately, the ones from Rogue Class he cannot pay for yet. On his end step, Scott casts Shoot the Sheriff, targeting Matt's Niv Mizzet. On the cast, it'll have Matt draw a card. Because Matt drew a card, he pings J-Man one point of life, and Scott used a treasure token in order to cast Shoot the Sheriff, so he starts cascading. Now, it's a two drop, so there's not that many options in his deck for him to hit, but he does end up finding a Soul Ring and casts that for free. I mean, you can't say no to a free soul ring. Niv Mizzet dies whenever Shoot the Sheriff resolves, and life insurance also triggers, so Scott will pay one life in order to make a treasure token. That was all on Chris's end step. So on a J-Man's turn, his first action is to activate Humble Defector, and he gives it over to Scott, trying to garner some favor there. He then draws his two fresh cards, and then he moves into combat, swinging at both Scott and Chris. His four Sand Warriors connect with Scott, and Skullwinder hits Chris. He then casts a Farewell in his second main phase. He chooses to have everybody exile all creatures, as well as all enchantments, leaving the board in a pretty miserable status for some. And everybody cleans up their board states. J-Man moves to his end step, having to discard a card, and onto Matt's turn. He casts Varen Voice of Duality as his first action. Following that, he plays Expressive Iteration. So he'll look at the top three cards of his library. So he'll get to put one card from among them into his hand, one on the bottom of his library, and one into exile that he could play this turn. Sadly, the math didn't math for him, so he just passes the turn over to Scott, who plays Battlefield Forge as his land, before casting his commander, Olivia Opulent Outlaw. He then casts Queen Marchesa, 
This thing's great. It's like she's a popular commander for a reason. So he becomes the monarch and Queen Marches is hasty. So he attacks Matt with her. And because he did so, this will trigger his commander, gaining him a treasure token. He then casts Misfortune Teller, and when that ETB'd, he exiles a land card from J-Man's graveyard, and therefore he gained a treasure token. On his end step, he drew a card, and on the Chris's turn, he takes one point of damage to his Lana War Wastes in order to cast Rampant Growth. He'll go and find a basic Swamp and have that enter the battlefield tapped. He then passes the turn over to J-Man. He draws, and on his turn seven, he plays that Arid Mesa that he grabbed out of his graveyard earlier. He then immediately cracks it in order to find a Plains. And with that out, he casts his commander, Yuma, Proud Protector. And when Yuma ETBs, he will sacrifice his Dunes of the Dead, sending that to the bin in order to make a 2-2 zombie. This will also allow him to draw a card off of Yuma and put a 4-2 out, out of the battlefield. On a Matt's turn, he plays Temple of Epiphany, scrying one, and keeping it on top. He then plays a Primal Amulet, reducing the costs of his spell slinging spells, and possibly making a copy land if it flips. On to Scott's turn, he plays a Smoldering Marsh, entering the battlefield tapped. Then he plays Rakdos Signet, before casting Dire Fleet Ravager. Holy guacamole, each player is gonna lose a third of their life rounded up. Therefore, Scott does all sorts of mathematics as he adjusts everybody's life totals, losing a third of their life rounded up. Then he casts Mari, the Killing Quill. She's got some hoops to jump through, but can really reward you if things line up. After that, he casts Changeling Outcast. This thing can't be blocked, so watch out. He moves into combat, attacking each one of his opponents to maximize Olivia's triggered ability. So he smashes into each one of them and trades for a token with his misfortune teller. When that happens, he makes some treasures thanks to Olivia and he managed to keep the monarch. So he draws a card before moving to Chris's turn. He plays Thieving Skydiver. When that ETBs, he steals Scott's soul ring, which is kind of funny. And he equips his lightning greaves and hits Scott in the air dealing some damage, but primarily gaining the Monarch token. He then moves into his end step to draw a card. On to J-Man's turn eight, he starts off by playing a Guardian Project. And now if he casts a creature spell, he'll start drawing cards. He plays Winding Way, naming Land. So he'll reveal the top four cards of his library and put a land card from among that into his hand. He found a basic forest as well as a windswept heath. Here he just grabs the forest and plays that immediately. This will allow him to play an Archivist of Ogma, primarily in order to trigger Guardian Project to find him a card that does something. Afterwards, he passes and Matt plays Cascade Bluffs as his land before casting Finale of Revelation. X will equal four here, and Varen's like, yo, if you do a thing because of a spell, then you do it again. So Primal Amulet gets two counters on it. Afterwards, Matt casts Serum Visions. So once again, Primal Amulet gets two counters and Varen gets bigger. Because Primal Amulet has four counters on it, it flips to Primal Wellspring. That's Serum Vision Resolve, so he did it. Then he casts Young Pyromancer. Maybe he'll start making some elementals. He moves into combat at J-Man, smacking into him and bringing him down to 12 points of life. On Scott's turn, on his upkeep, he makes a 1-1 assassin with death touch and haste. He then casts Awaken the Blood Avatar. So not only does it make each opponent sack a thing, it also gives him a 3-6 attacker with haste that drains his opponent's three whenever he attacks. But Scott didn't come prepared with the token. Where's the token, Scott? No, I left it up. I mean, Brandon probably has it. Do you have the Blood Avatar token? From this set? No, from Strixhaven. Blood oh, Avatar token? Yeah, it's a black and red avatar creature token. Mm. Black, red, what? Blood Avatar. What's the power I'm talking about? Three six. What's the colors? Black, red. Black and red. What's the creature type? Avatar. You said Dragon Fractal. You need a two. You need a one wild drowsy pawn <laughs> token. No. Did you say Stang Twin? No. No. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I'm gonna go to combat now. We have a giant collection of tokens, but Scott needs to come prepared, right? He moves into combat, swinging at each one of his opponents once again to maximize Olivia's value on the attack. The blood avatar token triggers and then drains each opponent three as well. J-Man and Matt both throw chump blockers in the way of his stuff and he still deals a ton of damage, bringing Chris to four, J-Man to eight, and Matt to eight. 
He gains the Monarch token again before casting Camber the Plunderer. And because of its partner ability, it'll get Loreen out of his deck and into his hand. Olivia had gained him some life, and he passes the turn over to Chris. He draws, loses a life to his Llanowar Wastes, and casts Arvanox, the Mind Flail. It's not a creature right now, sadly, but still pretty cool and exiles the bottom card of each opponent's library that he can cast later. On J-Man's turn, he plays Magmatic Insight, pitching a land card to the bin in order to draw two cards. J-Man then decides to cast a Decimate here. He then targets Arvanox, Rakdos Signa on Scott's board, its Blood Avatar token, as well as Scott's Exotic Orchard instead of Matt's Primal Wellspring because Matt sweet-talked him and convinced J-Man that he wasn't going to be a threat with it. J-Man then casts Lignify on Olivia, making her a tree. He passes the turn to Matt, feeling safe. Matt plays a mountain and betrays his good friend J-Man with a crackle of power where X equals two copied by the Primal Wellspring. This will have Matt deal 10 points of damage, a total of four times. The first crackle hit Scott and Chris and the second crackle hit J-Man and Scott. Makes Matt the winner, and as promised, here's Meatball. He's so chunky. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all of our wonderful Patreon subscribers. Your continued support truly goes a long way of helping out the channel and letting us grow. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon subscriber, please head over to patreon.com slash mostlycasualcommander. You can contribute with as little as $1 a month. That'll get you early access to the videos that we make, as well as access to an exclusive Discord chat and more. We had a ton of fun with these Outlaws of Thunder Junction pre-con decks. Thanks again to Wizards of the Coast. Be sure to get yours using the link in the description. And as always, thank you for watching.